Guys, Dollar 44 here. I need no introduction, but I got one anyway. You may remember last November I talked about how I'd been binge watching The Loud House during the pandemic. Well, earlier in that year, I also been watching this Channel 4 comedy called Friday Night Dinner. Friday Night Dinner was a British television sitcom written by Robert Pooper and starring Tasmin Gregg, Paul Ritter, Simon Bird, Tom Rosenthal, and Mark Heap. Before the pandemic occurred, I'd only ever watched one episode of the show. The face of the pandemic, I actually really did get into the show, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm glad I watched it. The comedy is focused on the regular dinner experience of the middle-class British Jewish from Goodman family every Friday night. The show aired on Channel 4 and received two BAFTA nominations in 2012. The idea of a family trying to get together for a Friday night meal is something that we've all seen before in our lives. But this show makes it interesting by adding some strange occurrences that you wouldn't expect to see in a family dinner. It's set in the suburban North London and filmed there, in Mill Hill. The family consists of mother, Jackie Goodman, father, Martin, elder son and musician, Adam, and younger son and estate agent, Johnny. The episodes follow the family as their sons arrive at the family home and proceed to their dinner, which is often interrupted by numerous things. Most frequently it's disrupted by Adam and Johnny pranking each other, Martin's oddities and their strange neighbour Jim Bell, who is attracted to Jackie. Jim visits the Goodmans frequently due to his loneliness, in most cases accompanied by his dog, whom he is afraid of. And to top it off, we have a great range of characters that we all know and love from the show. The characters in the show are very memorable, all depicting someone that we may have known in our lives or represented ourselves at some point. There's Jackie, the loving mother who takes no nonsense from her husband nor her boys and is frequently annoyed by their strange neighbour. She's a loving mother who just wants her Friday night family dinners to go smoothly, but because of the many strange things that happen, that doesn't always happen for them. There's Martin Goodman, the father of the family, who is one of the funniest characters on the show in my opinion. Coming up with crazy schemes like wanting to stuff a fox, hiding cheese in the toilet while he's on a diet. And he has these running gags where most times you see him in the house he's always got his shirt off because he claims he's boiling. And because he's got a hearing problem he claims that his hearing aid doesn't always work when people are trying to talk to him. So he either can't hear most of the things people say or he just pretends to not hear so he can get out of a conversation. I don't know which is which but either way it's funny. Paul Ritter plays the part so superbly and he gets the most laughs out of the show, in my opinion. Especially when he says this classic line. Shit on it! Shit on the bloody thing! Shit on it! Shit on it! Shit on the shitting thing! Shit on it! 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 Shit on the bloody thing! Shit on it! 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 Shitting! 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 Shit on it! 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 Over! Shit on it! Shit on it! Shit on a shit! Shit on it! Martin says it so frequently you could create a drinking game for it every time you watch the show. Shit on it! Over! I dare you guys to say that line the next time someone does something that pisses you off. Just see what reaction you'll get from it. Hmm. Shit on it! Will you turn that shitting music down? 
Yeah, I didn't know you liked Friday Night Dinner as well. Yeah, I love Friday Night Dinner. Yeah, buy it and then they crash it in the Mercedes and laugh about it. Yeah, I know, and when the boys put salt in their waters and all that stuff. And when Adam accidentally pushed Mr. Morris down the stairs. And horrible Grandma and Jim and Wilson. That is definitely the best show. It's the best. And I'm done! I'm done! I'm done! I'm done! There's Adam Goodman, the elder son of the family, and musician and advert jingle composer. You may remember him as Will McKenzie in the Inbetweeners series. Every time he arrives at his parents for Friday night dinner, Martin always has to ask him if he has a girlfriend yet, or as he calls them, females. So, any, um, females? I'm really not going to have that conversation with you right now. Adam is also known to be quite sarcastic in various situations, like a lot of his dad's various schemes, and some nice gestures from his mother. Adam seems to be one of the most sensible members of the family, but still being as nutty as the rest of them, including his brother Johnny, the younger son and estate agent. Johnny is the younger brother who constantly plays pranks on Adam just as Adam plays pranks on him, but in most of the scenarios Johnny's the one who starts the fight. Some of his common traits are squirting sneezy cream into his mouth. Now this I find funny and I can relate to it because I actually used to do that in my youth. If I was putting sneezy cream on my strawberries or ice cream, I'd have to squirt a bit in my mouth. I loved it that much. And putting salt in Adam's water. While the two don't always see eye to eye as you expect from siblings, they do often come together with various spins including helping their dad out of his crazy schemes or trying to stop their dad's crazy schemes. These two kind of remind me of me and my older brother when we were younger. Obviously we didn't take our pranking each other to the same extremes that these two did, but you could definitely relate to this sibling rivalry if you have a sibling of your own. Oh, you bastard! Oh, bloody salt again! It's not salt, it's gin! Gin? School! There's their bizarre dog-fearing neighbour, Jim Bell, played by Mark Heap. He's the very odd neighbour who constantly comes to the house at the bond time. He has an eye for Jackie, <laughs> and would do anything to get her attention. He has had two dogs in the show, the first one being Wilson from the first to the fifth series, and then after that dog passed away he moved on to Milson in the sixth series. The big running joke with this character is that he owns dogs and yet is afraid of them. And nobody knows why this guy would get a dog when he's afraid of dogs, but it's so funny that you honestly don't care. And he has very little understanding of Jewish culture, as is shown when he keeps saying Shalom. Shalom, shalom, of course, sh shalom, shalom, Jackie. Every now and then the family are joined by Nellie Buller, Jackie's mother, referred to as Grandma, played by the late Francis Cooker. She's very ditzy and doesn't know what's going on half of the time. And Grandma kind of reminds me of my nan, since they both like to speak what's in their minds, even when they don't know they're doing it. There's Jackie's best friend, Val Lewis, played by Tracy Ann Oberman, the neurotic woman who loves to visit the family every now and then. For the boy, she's known as Auntie Val. And this is another Tracy Ann character that I absolutely adore. If you know Tracy Ann Oberman, she's had roles including EastEnders, Doctor Who, and Thomas and Friends. And this shows just how much of a variety of characters she can pull off. Every now and then, the family tend to get joined by Cynthia Goodman, Marta's antagonistic mother, who is known to the family as Horrible Grandma because she's the most horrible grandma in the world. Well, universe. Well, perhaps multiverse. But anyway, she usually spends her time being horrible to the family, even her own son, Martin. Until in her last appearance, Martin finally snaps and tells him what a bad woman she is. I'm not taking this shit anymore. You, Cynthia Goodman, are a terrible mother. Hooray! And a terrible human being. Hooray! Then she passed away in that same episode. I'm honestly quite surprised they haven't done the aftermath where Auntie Val reacts to it yet, because she hated Horrible Grandma as well. We had a range of other characters in the show including Mr. Morris, the most angry person in the world. He had a number of appearances throughout the show, being one of the most angry people in the world, and the fiancé of Nelly. He had a frequency to park into things and then blame the buildings and objects for knocking into his car. And every now and then, and if he feels threatened, and if he feels threatened, then he'll challenge people to a fight. The show ran for six seasons and a Christmas special, 
With each episode having the family go through some strange occurrence while just trying to have a simple Friday night dinner. Their Friday night dinners would usually have them eating chicken, or as Martin calls it, Lovely bit of squirrel. <laughs> And sometimes they didn't always have chicken. They'd usually mix up the meals they'd have. Some nights they'd have beef, other nights they'd have lamb, and on some occasions they'd even go out for a meal. There was even one episode where they were planning to get a takeaway and needed it in their brand new hot tub, which never actually happened since Jim came round with his new girlfriend. And they spiced it up a little bit by having some episodes not take place while they're having Friday night dinner. Like say one episode they'd be going to a funeral, and another episode they'd be going to a wedding. So it was just a nice little change of pace for the show every now and then. Not always having to rely on Friday night dinner to enjoy Friday night dinner. If you get what I mean. It just spices things up a little bit and keeps the audience interested. The final episode had the two boys bring in their new girlfriends, who at the end of the episodes revealed that they were pregnant and were going to have babies. And when Jim randomly joins them as he does, he reveals that Milson had puppies. So it was a happy ending for all of them. The Sith series ended so perfectly that it made me wonder whether or not the show was going to come back for another series or perhaps just a one-off special. And it never did. On April 5th, 2021, Paul Vitto, who played Martin Goodman, passed away, leaving a huge legacy behind him. With a 10th anniversary retrospective of Friday Night Dinner to air later in 2021 in honour of his memory, the death of Paul Ritter saddens the hearts of every Friday Night Dinner fan and everyone who's ever watched him in every other project he's been in. Following the conclusion of the Sith series and the death of Ritter, it was announced that the show would not be returning. And I'll be honest, I'm okay with that. Let's be honest, I don't think it would have worked the same without him, so it's kind of best to let it rest. And plus, with the way they ended Series 6, it seems like a really good way to wrap things up. The boys finally have girlfriends, they're going to be parents, and they all live happily ever after. With one final shit on it for Martin. Shit on it. So it's needless to say that Friday Night Dinner has had quite an impact on the people who watched it on Channel 4 and on TV repeats. I recently heard that the Americans tried to do their own adaptions of this show. Since I've never heard of them or seen them on TV, it's needless to say that they probably never made it as well as Friday Night Dinner did. Because as many say, you can't recreate what's perfect. Friday Night Dinner is full of the kind of adult comedy you'd expect from a Channel 4 show, with some great slapstick comedy, great black comedy, and a great range of actors who give it their all in this fantastic show. And it showed the many aspects of living in a family. Not always being able to stand your family's antics, sometimes getting annoyed with your family's antics, but at the same time still loving them because they're family. This show truly was lightning that will never strike again. Friday Night Dinner will always be remembered by many as a great British comedy show. It had great characters, great storylines, great comedic occurrences, and it's just an all around great comedy in my opinion. And if you haven't seen the show yet, I'd highly recommend checking it out. You'll get a lot of laughs out of it if you're into this kind of comedy. I may have said this loads of times before in this video, but Friday Night Dinner is truly one of the great British comedies of all time, and it will be remembered by everyone for many years to come. I'm Darling44, and I'll see you next time, folks. Stop the shitting thing! Hey everybody, this is Dalek44 and by the time you watch this video I would have left this old house and moved to my new house. Yeah, sad news I know, I've been here for a long time. I actually grew up in this house. And I've been doing my videos here for a long time and a bunch of other stuff that's well, you know, outside of YouTube, which I'm sure that none of you give a shit about, but, uh, hey. So, yeah, I'm just finishing up packing my boxes here in my old bedroom. And soon I shall be leaving this house and going up to my new house. And it's going to be sad to leave this old place, because 
as I said I grew up here, but at the same time it's a brand new experience for me. I've never really moved before, so uh, it's been quite an experience. But the new place I got is really, really nice. You know, it's a really lovely place. The new bedroom I'll have isn't really as big as this one, but I'm going to have my own bedroom and my own studio for making videos. So any time you see brand new videos, it's going to be in a new house and in my new studio. So yeah, I just wanted to make this video just to update you guys on what's going on. I move in, this is the last time you'll see me in this old house, and the next time you see me it'll be in the new house. And for project updates, I'm definitely going to carry on making review episodes for my review show, because as I've said before, I'm just restricting it this year to specials, since I don't really have enough time to make a whole series. And Mini Amenity Smith Adventures will be coming out soon, but it'll be after I've moved to the new house and set everything up. Because I don't really want to rush everything, you know? So Mini Amenity Smith Adventures will be coming out very soon. Like, once I've settled into my new place and am able to get to work on it. So, yeah, that'll be coming soon. And for my reviews, I won't give any spoilers on what's to come next, but I will say it's a very, very special one. It's something that I've been looking forward to for a long time. And, yeah, it'll just be really great to start working on it at last. So, you'll expect to see that, hopefully, within the summer. But for now, I'm saying goodbye to this old house and... Well, to honour it properly, let's have a look at some of the best moments that I've had in this old place. And while we do that, I shall see you guys next time. Bye.
guys. Nice of you to drop by my new place. <laughs> I'm really settling into my new place and uh, I've been on quite a nostalgic kick recently. I'd say this nostalgic kick has been going on since the start of the pandemic, where I've just wanted to watch stuff that I used to watch as a kid. I mean, it's a no-brainer that I watched Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends, the classic series, but I've also started to look back at some of the other cartoons and shows I used to watch as a kid, some of the well-known ones, and some of the ones that have been forgotten over the years. Thanks to streaming services like Netflix and Disney+, Plus, I've been able to relive my childhood by watching some nostalgic classics. Very recently, I started looking back to an old classic from the 1960s, The Magic Roundabout. The Magic Roundabout is an English language children's television program that ran from 1965 to 1977. It used the footage of the French stop motion animated show La Magie Enchantée, but with completely different scripts and characters. And over the years, it's become a British cult classic, with many people remembering it as being a great icon of British animation, even though it was animated in France, but you get the idea. As you remember, I have talked about Dougal and the Blue Cat and the 2005 CGI movie based on this iconic show. But today I thought I'd talk about the history of the show and what an impact it left on us throughout the years. So sit back, relax and enjoy my look back at the magic roundabout. The whole thing started with a man named Serge Danod, who was born on the 7th of February 1931 and passed away on the 23rd of December 1990. He was a French animator and former advertising executive. Serge was born in France. As a young artist, he worked on the restoration of the Eiffel Tower and suffered an injury. While recuperating, he began practicing animation to relieve the boredom. When he made a recovery, he became a janitor at a filming company and had spent the next few years then in the tricks and trades of the industry. He would soon join French advertising company à La Comète, where he would make stop motion advertisements for them. During this time, he met Britain's Ivor Wood, and between them, they came up with the idea for the Magic Roundabout. For those of you who may not remember or just don't know. Ivor had directed a lot of children's classics in the 60s, 70s and 80s and late early 90s, including The Herbs, The Wombles, Paddington Bear, Postman Pat and Charlie Chalk to name a few. But The Magic Roundabout was where he started his animation career from what I know. In 1964, the first episode of The Magic Roundabout was broadcast in France and became an immediate hit with the audience. Then in the fourth episode, a funny little creature known as Pollitz, who would later become Dougal in the English versions, appeared. After the success of the Magic Roundabout in France, in 1969, Serge Danot established his own company called Danot Films, where he would continue to work on the Magic Roundabout for years. Of course, the Magic Roundabout, known about then as Le Magica Carousel, not sure if I said that correctly, was a huge hit in France in the 1960s. But it really took off when it came over to England. 
the show became an immediate hit for French audiences and even sparked the interest of people from other countries, including the BBC in Britain. Then eventually in October 1965, the show crossed the channel and became the UK's most loved children's show of its time. The key to this plan was famous actor Eric Thompson, the children's presenter who was entrusted by the BBC for creating the voices for the English version of the show. This is going to be the greatest picture ever made, said Dougal modestly. This will make Ben-Hur look like an advertisement for Turkish delight. This will make Ken Russell spit with jealousy. Take one. He decided to not use any of the dialogue for the French series, and he came up with his own words that fitted what was happening on the screen. What? shrieked Brian. Come back, you coward! When Eric Thompson made the decision to adapt the show for English audiences, he never looked at the French script. He just turned down the volume for each episode and just made up his own stories that managed to fit what was happening on the screen. So the characters that we all grew up with in England didn't come from what Serge Danot originally created. It was all from the mouth of Eric Thompson. A similar technique which would be used for another French animated series known as Hector's House, which ran from 1966 to 1970 and has been sold on VHS tapes for years and has only had one DVD release so far with only 30 episodes. You must have got lost amongst all your old chuck. It isn't old chuck. Well, Serge's big hairy dog Pollard's became Dougal, a bizarre mixture of a dual Scotsman and Tony Hancock. You are late. We've got a lot to do and you're late. If you were in a union, I'd sack you. Now pull yourself together and concentrate on the working hand. Really, you're pathetic. Dougal was always one of my favourite characters because he was always running around coming up with crazy ideas and eating sugar. And I'll trouble you all to keep your thieving hands off it. <laughs> and he had a very distinctive way of eating sugar. In my opinion, Dougal was the one that stole the show because he had the most entertaining amount of storylines for him. And he had some of the funniest lines too. Uh, which way did the ornery coyotes go? The what? said Florence. The, uh, <clears throat> oh, um, oh, oh, I'll never keep this up. Oh, I'll get a sore throat. <laughs> Indians? I didn't order Indians. What are you doing, Dougal? I'm fishing off the end of Brighton Pier. Well, perhaps they're writing him out of the series, said Dougal. <laughs> like they do, <laughs> if you're not careful. <laughs> Watch the birdie. What? said Dougal. What did you say? What? 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 There's no need to snap. I only said, Watch the birdie. I'm in truth, the cow was very posh for in her own way and was very fond of singing. I'm forever blowing, but whoops! <laughs> old man river, that old man river, he don't say nothing, but he must know something. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, I appear to have fallen off a bridge. Well, obviously. Dylan became the hippie-like guitar playing rabbit that we all know today. He was rather dopey and was very fond of sleep at any chance he could. What are you doing up there, little rabbit? I reckon it's like uh, safer and not so tiring, ma'am. I don't know, ma'am, said Dylan. Whenever I hear the word cats, I feel like uh, sleepy. Funny fellow. Brian the slow moving snail became a cheerful optimist who was well meaning. Mm, that's all I need. A jolly laughing snail. <laughs> the things I suffer. Anne was always the butt of Dougal's insults. I'm stuck on a harp. Well, you would choose the harp, wouldn't you? Great oaf. What have you come as, snail? said Dougal. I shall win, said Brian. Pardon me while I have a little giggle, said Dougal. Drilling for oil. <laughs> Great clump. Do you mean to tell me? said Dougal, that that pathetic little moppet came in first. <laughs> he couldn't beat an egg. I'm here, I'm here, said Brian. Oh, bully, said Dougal. Never point guns at people. It's dangerous. What about pointing them at snails? He wouldn't know a rustler if it fell on him. 
<laughs> oh, 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 you pathetic little clump. You potty little clump. Oh, I think you're rotten. Oh, I'll do that snail a mischief one day. I take it you are voting for me, said Dougal. I feel I should warn you that if you don't, I shall leap on you and pound you into the ground. And he made Florence a Christopher Robin type character. A level-headed girl that the audience could relate to. Do you think we should do some work? Or something? I think I'm a bit young for actual work, said Florence. Then there's Zebedee, a good-hearted wizard who resembles a jack-in-the-box. He brings happiness and joy to the inhabitants of the Enchanted Garden. He's usually the one that brings Florence to the Magic Garden from the Magic Roundabout. Uh, shall we go? Why not? said Florence. And he's always the one that says the classic phrase, Time for bed. at the end of most episodes. And he often knows when Dougal's gone too far with some of his schemes and sometimes puts a stop to it. Like the time when he made that hair growth formula. No, 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 I'm hearing enough. Stop it. No, get off. Get off. That'll teach him. And then there's the train, another one of my favourite characters because she is, of course, a steam engine. She's always happy to give the residents of the Magic Garden a ride to anywhere they want to go. And she is very polite, but is not afraid to speak out when she comes across something that displeases her. Like, say, an awful bridge, rustlers, having to carry freight and Dougal's attitude towards things. Fancy a grown dog playing with bubbles. Really? Huh. It'll be Dolly's next. Dr. Beeching, where are you? Open your mouth and you get your funnel bitten off. It wasn't like this in the sidings at Clapham, I can tell you. You can say that again said the train. And then there were other characters including Mr. Rusty, the magic roundabout runner who played a little barrel organ with birds on top and then the children would come and ride on his roundabout. And then there was Mr. McHenry, the gardener, who took care of all the plants in the magic garden. Each episode of the show would have each of the characters go through some sort of crazy mishap, like say Dougal trying to transport her piano onto the train to go to Edinburgh for a festival. Well, they couldn't get Liberace. Dougal searching for gold, Dougal trying to become a member of parliament, Dylan making a spaghetti meal, and many other mishaps that were entertaining to watch. The English version of the show became so popular and ran from 1965 to 1977. The show would air just before the 6 o'clock news, back in the days when there were very few TV channels, and it was during the time before kids would go to bed and the grown-ups would come home from work. Eric's entertaining mannerisms gave the magic roundabout the cult reputation it has today. With his mild innuendos and quirky characters, he turned this French series into an English institution that would be remembered for many years to come. We're all going to be filthy rich, especially me. I shall be a snailionaire, and I shall retire from public life. I shall buy a yacht and a lot of toffees and have me shell painted. And Eric Thompson never believed in talking down to the children. He always treated them as just young adults. And that was part of the charm of his narrations. The series has been released on VHS throughout the 80s and 90s, but has so far never had a DVD release. And you may remember that years ago I did an editorial talking about why I think the Magic Roundabout show should get a DVD release. And I still stand by that to this day. Come on BBC, make it happen for Christ's sake. Don't attempt to deny it. Come on, empty your pockets. While I wasn't born in the 1960s, I was introduced to this classic series thanks to VHS tapes that my grandparents and my parents owned. I used to watch them every day when I went up to see them along with other classics including Thomas the Tank Engine, Super Ted and many others. So if it wasn't for my parents and my grandparents then I may have never been introduced to the Magic Roundabout in the first place. And looking back at it I'm very glad that I was introduced to this 60s animated series. And it was one of the many things that sparked my interest in animation. Hence a couple of my episodes of Second Code being based on Magic Roundabout stories. The Magic Roundabout got so popular that in the mid 70s Serge Danault went to create his first full screen feature film based on the show, Dougal and the Blue Cat. He 
You may remember I've done a review of this series, so you'll be able to get a full details of my thoughts on that. But I'll just go through the story real quick. The story centers around Dougal, who becomes very suspicious when a blue cat arrives in the Magic Garden. It turns out the cat named Buxton was working for an unseen voice named the Blue Voice, voiced by Fenella Fielding, in an abandoned factory on top of a hill, who wanted to take over the garden and turn everything into the color blue. Upon this takeover, the residents of the garden end up being imprisoned except for Dougal, who made a plan to rescue his friends. My review goes into a lot more details about this movie, but it's definitely darker than the series that we've gotten before this. Having all the characters being imprisoned and chained up, Dougal having to face his ultimate weakness of being locked in a room full of sugar, and the menacing villains of Buxton and the Blue Voice. And this was the first time a Magic Roundabout project had had more than one actor in it since Eric Thompson returned to do the voices as well as the writing, and he got Fenella Fielding to voice the Blue Voice, and she just sounds so chinly menacing that you can't help but love that performance. You are no longer king. You are nothing. Out of my sight before I lose my temper, and when I lose my temper there's trouble, 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 trouble. And looking back at it since I last reviewed it, it still holds up to this day being quite dark compared to the original show. And Eric Thompson and Fenella filled in great performances in the movie. And so far this is the only Magic Roundabout film from the Classics series to have been released on DVD, thanks to British reviewer Mark Kermode. It's a fun film that you'll get a lot of kicks watching if you're a Magic Roundabout fan and an animation fan in general, so I would highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. Mikey, Mikey. While the series may have ended, and the Dougal and the Blue Cat was a big hit in with audiences, that didn't spell the end for the Magic Roundabout entirely. In the United States, the series was called The Magic Carousel, and it aired in the 1980s on Pinwheel, a program on the children's channel Nickelodeon. This version used American actors such as Michael Carp, the voice of Dougal in this version, and was based on the original French incarnation, such as the scripts being word-for-word -word translations, and the characters having voices strikingly similar to the French dub's voices. My dear Brian, I come in at midnight. Oh, that's right, Mr. Dougal. You're the one in charge of the fireworks for Miss Ermintrude's birthday party. Dylan and Mr. McHenry also retained their original French names, Flappy and Mr. Young, respectively, with Mr. Rusty having Mr. McHenry's name. Aside from that, however, most of the characters have their names from the British version. During the early 90s, Channel 4 brought back the Magic Roundabout for another set of series. But sadly, Eric Thompson had passed away before then. What? 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 So they entrusted from British comedian Nigel Planer to dub the episodes that were never aired in the UK. Are you going to ring or not? What time did you set it for? asked Florence. Just about now, said Dougal, and hid behind the tree again. He redid a couple of episodes that were already done in his own style and he dubbed over episodes that were never aired in the UK. Now obviously Nigel Planner had big shoes to fill since Eric Thompson was iconic for his writing and his voices for the characters, but I think he did a great job at bringing the characters to life and bringing in these new stories that were never aired before. He definitely had his own charm to him and his voices suited the characters just like Eric's voices did. Uh, right, uh, wow, said Dylan. Dylan, are you with us, said Florence. And those new episodes were so popular that they ended up doing another dub of episodes, this time with Jimmy Hibbert. Who have voiced many characters including Isambard Bearbo Toad in A Tale of Two Toads, Dr. Von Guzman in Count Duckula, and many other characters. He too had his own charming quirk to this whole thing like Nigel Planner and Eric Thompson. And his episodes would usually rerun on Cartoon Network during the 90s. Jimmy Hibbert brought a lot of great voices to the characters, and he does his best to carry on the humour that Eric Thompson and Nigel Planner brought in. While of course making it his own like the previous two did. Oh dear. Ermintrude and Brian must think I'm completely bonkers. I told them I could see two of them. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! While Nigel and Jimmy are no Eric Thompson in my opinion, they're still good narrators that give their own spin to this classic series. And if you can find their dubs of the episodes anywhere, then I would highly recommend checking them out if you haven't already. You'll probably get some good laughs out of them like you would have done with Eric Thompson's narrations. And if you love Nigel Planner's voices and Jimmy Hibbert's variety of voices, then this is a definitely a good watch. 
even though the Magic Round about ended its time on TV during the 70s, people never forgot about it, and it's still known and loved in today's pop culture. The show also had lots of merchandise sold with them. Toys, and posters, they even got to be in Happy Meals at McDonald's in the early 2000s, alongside other British children's characters. They had this thing where they would have two or three characters from each TV series be part of a Happy Meal, and the ones they chose for the Magic Roundabout were Dougal, Ermintrude and Zebedee. In fact, I still have the three Magic Roundabout beanie toys that came with Happy Meals, and I hold them dearly to this day. The characters were even lucky enough to get featured in advertisements for various products like the Laughing Cow and House Moving Estate Agents. It was that popular and iconic back then. Where would you like to live? Oh, anywhere, except France. <laughs> then in 2005, the iconic characters returned in the Magic Roundabout CGI movie. Again, I already reviewed this movie in full detail, so you can see my full details of my thoughts and opinions there. But like Dougal and the Blue Cat, I'll go through the story real quick for you guys. The movie is about Dougal, Ermintrude, Brian and Dylan going on a quest to stop Zebedee's evil twin Z-Bad, who intends in creating an eternal winter. The movie was made using modern computer animation, and unlike the previous Magic Roundabout projects, it gave each character their own voices rather than having a narrator. The voices included Tom Baker as the evil Z-Bad, Joanna Lumley as Ermintrude, Sir Ian McKinnon as Zebedee, Jim Broadbent as Brian, Kylie Minogue as Florence, Robbie Williams as Dougal, Bill Nye as Dylan, Lee Evans as The Train, and Ray Winston as Soldier Sam. They even got Jimmy Hibbert to voice Mr. Rusty and some of the other minor characters in the movie. Like Dougal and the Blue Cat, years on since I last reviewed it, the Magic Roundabout movie still holds up to this day, being a great tribute to the show, and it keeps the characters the same as they are through Eric Thompson's writing. It's a fun watch and has a lot of great comedic moments as well as dramatic moments, and Tom Baker is just a delight as Z-Bad. I mean, you could tell from his voice that he was just having a lot of fun voicing this character. The pressure! It's too much! I know! I know! Sometimes I feel I'm going quite insane! So if you haven't checked out this movie yet, I highly recommend watching it if you love animation and the Magic Roundabout. In 2006, the film was released in the US as Dougal. The majority of the original British voices were replaced by celebrities familiar to the American public, such as Whoopi Goldberg and Sheaf Chase. I've honestly never watched this movie yet, since I've heard so many bad things about it. So I honestly have no intent in watching the American version, since I think the British one is the standalone version in my opinion. After the success of the movie, Nickelodeon wasted no time in bringing the Magic Roundabout characters back for another series. In 2007, a new TV version of the Magic Roundabout was created, with 52 11 minute episodes. Every episode of the show began with Zebedee giving a brief summary to the audience of what will happen before the plot begins. The episodes would also end with Zebedee throwing a party after the problems had been solved, with Dylan remarking, I wish it was time for bed, man, referencing the original series quote, time for bed, before drifting off to sleep. The show was broadcast on the 22nd of October 2007 on the channel Nick Jr. The series picks up where the 2005 movie left off. The show brought in many other voice actors, and brought back Jimmy Hibbert to voice a couple of the characters, Bringing Jimmy Hibbert in to write a couple of episodes, as well as voice a lot of the characters, did make sense since he did narrate some episodes during the 90s. I just wish they could have brought Nigel Planner back, then it would have been the full set. In my opinion, this new series didn't really create that same feel of magic and nostalgia that the original series did, but I honestly wasn't expecting it to, because you can't recreate the classics. But it is entertaining for what it's worth and I'm sure some kids may have enjoyed it back in the day since it lasted that long. So the 2007 reboot's not really my cup of tea, but if you're interested to see it, then I would recommend checking it out just to see what it's like and to get your opinions out. So it's not really my cup of tea, but if you're interested to see it, then go ahead. So with this great history out of the way, what does the future hold for the Magic Roundabout? Well, it's quite hard to say at this point. 
but people will still remember it as being a great English institution. And it still holds up in British pop culture. So overall, The Magic Roundabout is a classic British series which is a lot of fun to watch, and I highly recommend checking it out if you're a fan of animation and Eric Thompson. It had a lot of good laughs, a lot of great characters, the storylines were entertaining, and some might say it's trippy as hell. I say it's a fun British show that you'll love if you're into animation and comedy and Eric Thompson. <laughs> Soppy thing. Well, I gotta say, it's been a hell of a blast looking back at The Magic Roundabout, one of my favourite childhood shows. And my new adventures in my new house have only just begun. So until next time, this is Starlet44 saying, ciao. Guys, Dalek 44 here. I need no introduction, but I've got one anyway. Well, it's Valentine's Day again. Valentine's Day, also called St. Valentine's Day or the Feast of St. Valentine, is celebrated annually on the 14th of February. Over the years, it's become a significant cultural, religious, and commercial celebration of romance and love in many regions in the world. During this time of year, people send their loved ones cards, chocolates, and any other gifts just to show how much they love each other. And as I said, it's celebrated every year on this particular day. Happy Valentine's Day, Simon! Oh. Happy Valentine's Day, Miss Tiny! How are you finding the new house? I love the new house! It's so peaceful and quiet! The perfect place to live! It is very peaceful, isn't it, love? Definitely is the perfect place to live. Mind you, I do miss my old house, but... Uh, I must say, I'm really liking this new place. I'm glad you like it too, lovely. <laughs> anyway, as it's Valentine's Day, I thought I'd talk about one of my favourite animated couples, Luna Loud and Sam Sharp from The Loud House. Out of all the romantic relationships in The Loud House, the Sam and Luna one is the one that I enjoy the most. It involves Luna Loud, played by Nicka Futterman, who, by the way, the Sonic community will probably kill me if I don't bring this up, was the voice of Styx in Sonic Boom. And Sam Sharp, who was voiced by Alison Stoner, who you may remember as Isabella from Phineas and Ferb. Interesting side note, in her first appearance, Sam was actually voiced by Jill Talley, who voiced other characters in The Loud House. I assume they changed the voice actor because she already had enough voices to do as it was. But this love story has been going on throughout the show ever since the Season 2 episode, Elle is for Love, and the two have even become symbols of Pride Month. But the best way to start the story of Luna and Sam is to go back to where it all started, in the episode of Elle is for Love. In Elle is for Love, Luna is revealed to have a crush on a girl named Sam, whom the audience is initially led to believe is a boy. Throughout the episode, she is hesitant about giving a token of her affection to Sam, and eventually places a love letter in Sam's locker at the end of the episode. It is then revealed to the audience that Sam is actually a girl, which in turn reveals that Luna is bisexual meaning that she's sexually attracted to both men and women. Like Captain Jack Hartness from Doctor Who and Torchwood, a guy who likes both genders. Now this would make sense since in season one she did develop a crush on Lincoln's of English tutor Hugh. 
Oh, by the way, that facial expression from her is so goddamn hilarious. Before that ending reveal, we had no idea that Sam was going to be a girl. We all just assumed that Sam was going to be another boy. But then it turned out that Luna likes girls. And that's a very good twist for a TV show. After that episode, Sam would make more appearances throughout the show, most of the time with Luna. In the episode Frenzy, in a dispute over privileges with her siblings, Sam is the first of many of Luna's friends she invites into her place in order to gain special privileges. Well, it wasn't that clear to the audience if they were going out or not because Sam didn't have a speaking role in the episode. But I suppose you could click the fact that Sam was touched by that love letter, so you could assume that they started dating at that point. While they had set up the Luna and Sam love story in the Loud House, they wouldn't get a proper episode to themselves until halfway through season 3. Sam wouldn't make another big appearance again until the episode Racing Hearts, where Luna and Sam participate in the Royal Woods Astonishing Quest. Initially, Luna believes the two of them would be perfect partners together. However, as they progress throughout various challenges, they begin to realise how much less they have in common. Even when Luna takes Laurie's advice to embrace Sam's interests so she can better understand her. First one is Laser Quest. Luna manages to score 100 points by zapping Lisa and Darcy, but when Scoops and her partner Helen sit by, Sam fumbles with her laser and accidentally zaps Luna. The next challenge is collecting a dozen eggs from a farm in the chicken house. Sam is able to collect eggs after communicating with them, but when the chickens crowd around Luna, she ends up losing her balance and falls onto Sam, dropping all their eggs. The third challenge is copying moves in a dance hall. But Sam reveals that she's not much of a dancer and ends up knocking down all the contestants. During a rock climbing challenge, Sam climbs the wall flawlessly. However, Luna is stangling and tells Sam that climbing isn't her thing. And Sam, clearly not surprised by this, grabs the next clue and heads back down. The next challenge is at the organic juice store where they have to drink new juices and guess the flavours. They both take a sip, Sam manages to list off some of the ingredients. Luna pretends to like it, but disgusted with its taste, spits it all over Sam. The challenge after that is at Tall Timbers Park where they have to sail a boat across a pond. Luna continues to take interest in this since Sam mentions that she loves sailing. As they ride into the pond, Sam tries to instruct Luna on what to do. But Luna, having zero knowledge on what she's talking about, accidentally loosens the sail, causing it to spin rapidly and fling the two off the boat as they cross the pond. On the final challenge, they had learned that they did have something in common, which is their lack of interest in bacon, which resulted in a big mess and a nice little romantic moment between the two. <laughs> Despite the fact that they didn't win, the two had a lot of fun, saying that even though they don't have much in common, they want to spend time together so they can discover new things that they love together. And they end up with a hug and a nice little neck nuzzle. This episode just cemented their love story for me, and it's one of my favourite Luna Loud episodes as well. Sam made another big appearance in the episode Deep Cuts, where she protests alongside Luna and their bandmates to save their music club at school. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, they formed a band with other members, known as the Moon Goats. Sam's next big appearance would be in the episode Perfect Gig, where she helps Luna cat sit the McBride's cats. Originally, Luna was meant to do it on her own and not invite anyone over since the cats get anxious around strangers. But Luna figured that the cats would be alright with Sam since animals love her. And they successfully managed to take care of the cats and send them a lullaby to get them to sleep. Tiny. After getting the cats to sleep successfully with that beautiful song, Sam is about to leave, but ends up remembering that her little brother Simon is still in the house. So Sam and Luna have to try and sneak Simon out of the house before the McBrides get back, but to no avail. After being paid for their hard work, Sam gives her half of the money to Luna so that she could buy a VIP pass to McSwagger's concert that she did this for in the first place. Much to Luna's happiness, who kisses her on the cheek and hugs her as an affection of thanks. And they end up waking up the cats and having to sing them the lullaby again. 
him and Luna and Sam sing together was a really nice touch for this episode. And I thought it was really sweet how Luna kissed Sam on the cheek near the end of the episode. In the episode Scoop Sotten, Sam helps Luna get Lenny, Luan and Lincoln to confess that they have been reading Luna's diary by dressing up as a girl named Roxy, who Luna had written about in a fake story and going around town with Luna in order to fool the siblings. Despite this being a ridiculous plan, it shows that Sam's willing to go with Luna's plan just to teach her siblings a lesson, and it shows that like any good couple would do anything for her. In Band Together, Sam is seen performing with Luna in their band, but they both play guitar and sing side by side at one point. Sam was shown to have shown some sadness for Luna wanting to go off on her own with the big musical manager without the band, but at the same time did show her support. And when their friend Chunk was given a new contract to be a big singer, she happily let Luna join the band again as the lead singer. This shows that no matter what obstacle comes their way, the two will never stop loving each other. Despite Luna temporarily leaving the band to be a big rock star, that wasn't enough to separate her from Sam. And their love story would go on throughout season 5. Despite these many appearances, Sam isn't confirmed to be Luna's girlfriend until the episode Undercover Mum, where Luna reveals to Sam as her girlfriend and talks about how they got into an argument over a song. In Laurie days, Luna has a movie date with Sam before being interrupted by Laurie in a hilarious fashion. And I'm just gonna say right now, these two holding hands in the cinema is just so freaking adorable. In the episode Dan's Reputation, where Luna temporarily joins her dad's new band, she tries everything she can to make sure that Sam and the rest of the band members don't see her. But when she and Doodads perform at a concert near the end of the episode, Sam is there with the rest of her friends and cheer Luna on. That look alone is so adorable to me, and it's one of my favourite Luna moments. In In the Mick of Time, Sam attended a school concert where Luna was disguised as Mick Swagger after failing to get him to perform at the concert. Now you'd think that at this point that Sam might have gotten the misunderstanding and broken up with Luna for this lie. But after the real Mick Swagger, voiced by Jeff Bennett, shows up and they turn a duet together, Sam clearly enjoys seeing the two up on stage together and the two have a dance together at the end, showing that no matter what obstacles come their way, love will truly conquer all. That was a super sweet ending shot, but a little part of me thinks that it would have been better if it ended with them having their first lip to lip kiss. Sam also makes a speechless cameo appearance in the Loud House movie, where she was among the crowd watching Luna perform rock and music on the stage. She even appeared in the live action film A Loud House Christmas, where she invites Luna to join her family on a ski trip on Christmas Day. In the live action Christmas special, she was played by Zoe Duval. I don't know if I said that correctly. Outside the show, the two have made a couple of appearances in various comics including Live Life Loud and the story Midnight Melody in After Dark. It just shows that the writers are really dedicated to their love story, and the fans are truly dedicated to it as well since we see lots of fan art of them on the internet, including one made by yours truly, but don't like to blow me on trumpet. <laughs> The two have also been made symbols of Pride Month back in 2021, and these two have become fan favourites over the years. And throughout the show we've had several couples throughout the series, including Laurie and Bobby, fan theory of Lincoln and Ronnie Ann, Clyde's insane crush on Laurie, Luann and Benny, and Clyde's parents. And various ones that were hinted on at Ellis for Love, but were never actually touched upon in any other episodes. Yet. I say yet because I have no idea if they'll ever be touched upon. Luna and Loud are also one of those few couples in children's animated shows that are the same sex couple. Now we all know it's not uncommon to have from same sex couples in TV shows and movies, but back in the old days it was usually for adult comedies like American Dad. They even recently made Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy a idol in the recent Harley Quinn TV series. But over the years we've seen it done in other forms of media including Marceline and Princess Bubblegum from Adventure Time, these two idiot cops from Gravity Falls, and as I said, Clyde's parents are the same sex couple. But that was before Luna and Sam were even introduced. I mean, we have had some campy characters going back to the 80s of children's TV shows like Skeleton from Super Ted, but we never actually see him going out with anyone, and he usually only is very mushy-mushy around bulk. 
though it's a real nice change of pace that we're getting more same-sex couples in children's TV shows these days. And I don't know if I'm the only one here, but I'm personally waiting for Luna and Sam to get their first lip-to-lip -lip kiss in the series. I mean, I know Luna did kiss Sam in the episode Perfect Gig, but that was just on the cheek, and we mostly see them hugging each other. I hope they get their first kiss too, Simon. They've been together for most of the show. So do I, Miss Tiny. So do I. So it would be really lovely to see them have their first kiss in the show. Maybe they'll do it in a later episode for season 5, or maybe they'll do it for season 6. Who knows? But I'm hoping it'll be worth the wait. Whether or not they do get their first kiss in the next season or a future episode before season 6, then we're going to have to wait and see. But Luna and Sam's love story is definitely one of the most entertaining ones I've seen for a long time. Now I've recently heard on the internet that Luna and Sam's relationship is half and half at the moment. Some people are absolutely loving it and some people not being too keen on the idea and would rather Luna hunt out with a boy. But whatever your thoughts are, there's no denying that this has become really popular within the show. And as I said, it led to the two becoming a symbol of Pride Month last year. So if they were able to become a symbol for Pride Month last year, then they've obviously become so iconic in the series. And it's become very clear in various episodes that came after Learners for Love that the writers are really dedicated to this relationship. I'd say they're just as dedicated to it as they are with Laurie and Bobby. And it's definitely a lot more dedication than those some love interests we never got to see in full force after Airless for Love. Oh, by the way, because I forgot to mention this a couple of minutes ago, Lily having a crush on her teddy bear is just so freaking adorable. It kind of reminds me of how clingy I was to my cuddly toys when I was a little boy. So whether you like it or not, Luna and Sam are some of the most popular couples within TV media as well as The Loud House. And it's very clear that the writers have more plans for these two in the future. And whatever the writers' plans are, I really do hope that Sam and Luna's love story will last throughout the whole run of the series. It's one of my favourite relationships of all time, and Luna and Sam are two of my favourite characters of all time. And I hope to see their first kiss sometime in the future of The Loud House. I'm Donald44, and I'll see you next time, folks. Well then, Miss Tiny, since the review's out of the way, shall we retire to the bedroom and put on PJ Masks on Disney Plus? Ah, oh, I love the PJ Masks. Owlette is the coolest of the trio. She certainly is, Miss Tiny. She certainly is. Tell you best dance ever. Thanks, no. Hey guys, Darling44 here. I need no introduction, but I got one anyway. Well, the Chris Chibnall era of Doctor Who is coming to an end very, very soon, and we'll be entering the new era, run by original showrunner for 2005, Russell T. Davis. Ever since Doctor Who returned to our TV screens in 2005, the show has been through three showrunners as of late. From 2005 to 2010, we've had Russell T. Davis, and most Doctor Who fans would agree that his era was the number one for the new series. And from 2010 to 2018, we've had Stephen Moffat, whose series has been hit and miss with a lot of fans. And from 2018 to this year, we've had Chris Chibnall, who most people hate. Well, hate's a bit of a strong word. His run has been hit and miss as well. But more people see it as a miss rather than a hit. But there's one thing that we can all agree on, Chris Chibnall has been very serious about bringing back some of the old favourites. 
you name it, Daleks, Cybermen, Sontarans, Sea Devils, Captain Jack Harkness, he had a great emphasis on bringing those back in his era. Series 11 was a huge departure from the previous seasons because it had no classic monster show up until the New Year's Day special resolution, when they brought back the Daleks. And since then, Chris Chimno has been bringing back lots of the old favourites from the show. The Master, Captain Jack Harkness, the Jadoon, the Cybermen, the Daleks again, the Sontarans, the Weeping Angels, Kate Ledbridge Stewart of Unit, the Daleks again, the Sea Devils. He'd also given us cameos from old favourites including the Ood and the Sycorats and the Silence in Revolution of the Daleks, as well as giving the new the supporting role in the Flat series. And for the upcoming Centenary special, he's bringing back the Daleks, the Cybermen, Ashard the Lone Cyberman, the Master, Tegan, Ace, and Kate Ledbridge Stewart. So however you look at Tris Chibnall's head writing style, he's had a great emphasis on bringing back some of the classic monsters and the old favourites from past seasons. And with Russell T Davis here at point two, we can expect to see some phenomenal Dalek stories like he did back in the old days. When Chibnall first brought back the Daleks in Resolution, he proved that he could handle the Daleks better than Stephen Moffat did. Because let's be honest, Moffat's era made it seem like the Daleks were just there just because they felt obliged to be there. Whereas Chibnall actually wrote them as good villains again since the Russell T Davis era. Then when he wrote Revolution of the Daleks, he brought back that old feel that the classic series episode Remembrance of the Daleks had with two Dalek factions fighting each other while introducing us to new ranks of Daleks, including the Reconnaissance Scouts and the Death Squads. Then the Rishan Muria special, Eve of the Daleks, saw the Daleks with a new rank known as the Executioners. So it's needless to say that Chris Chibnall understands the Daleks almost as much as Russell T. Davis did. And like Moffat, Chibnall has kept on the Time War Dalek designs that were introduced in 2005 while at the same time creating two new one-off Dalek designs with the Reconnaissance Scout Dalek and the Defense Drone Daleks. So to celebrate the upcoming new era of Russell T. Davis for Doctor Who, we're going to take a look at the history of the Time War Daleks. Many fans would say that the Time War actually started in the 1975 episode, Genesis of the Daleks, when the Time Lords sent the Doctor back in time to the Daleks' creation to prevent it, because they foresaw a time when they would become the dominant species in the universe. So to New Who fans, this could hint that they probably saw their victory in the Time War and wanted to prevent it. So you could say that that was when the first fire was shot from the Time Lords. And then the final straw for the Daleks was in Remembrance of the Daleks, when the Doctor tricked Davros into using the Hand of Omega to destroy Scarlet. And so began the last great Time War. The war to end all wars between the Time Lords and the Daleks. The war had severe consequences on the universe. While it was invisible to smaller species, it was devastating to higher forms of life. But we'll get to those in a bit. In fact, the war was so famous, or infamous depending on how you see it, that the Sontaran Empire even wanted to join the fight, being rejected by both Daleks and Time Lords. In the last great time war. The finest war in history and we weren't allowed to be part of it. Was that? I think it's the sound of no one caring! The Eighth Doctor fought in the Time War, and then the War Doctor fought in it. And during the final days, Rassilon, President of the Time Wars, had planned to initiate the final sanction and bring about the end of time, destroying all of reality, while the Doctor planned to use the moment to destroy Daleks and Time Lords. But thanks to 13 incarnations of the Doctor, they were able to save Gallifrey from extinction and destroy the Daleks in the crossfire. While the Time War was over, it had many severe consequences for various life forms. The Zygons lost their home world in the first days of the Time War, and since then have been looking to find a new home, mainly Earth. Then Esteem Consciousness's home was destroyed in the Time War, and it set out to conquer Earth like it did before with the Third Doctor. The Gelf's home planet was destroyed in the war, reducing them to gas creatures that attempted to take over Victorian London and possess dead bodies. And it's been hinted that Eve from the Sarah Jane Adventures and the rest of her species were probably affected by the Time War. She said there were many exterminations. But for we know, that could either be the Time War or just a regular Dalek invasion. Who the hell knows? But the final days of the Time War wasn't enough to end the Dalek Empire completely, as the Doctor found out in the 2005 episode, Dalek. Before the end of the war, one Dalek fell from time and landed on the Ascension Islands around 1962. Insane and screaming, it passed through several private collections in the 20th and 21st centuries. 
by 2012, it was in the possession of billionaire Henry Van Staten, who kept it in a cage. With the intention of reaching other Daleks, they sent out a distress signal which was detected by the Ninth Doctor and Rose Tyler. Initially unaware of the source of the distress signal, the Doctor came to investigate. The Doctor and the Metaltron, as Van Staten called it, had a hostile discussion about the end of the war and the Doctor tried to kill it before being stopped by Van Staten. When Rose met the creature, it seemed to be a harmless victim and, in an attempt to comfort it, she touched its dome. It absorbed her Artron energy and DNA and regenerated itself, escaping from the cage, making its way upwards through the vault to the surface, killing Van Staten's personnel as it went. And I think we can all agree that that first kill it made with its sucker on was so badass and terrifying, and it still is to this day. It made its way through the floors of the museum, using its new levitation skills to get upstairs, killing many of the employees with its ray gun and using water and electricity for its gun to kill many people in a snap. By the time it reached the surface, it had begun to mutate and started to feel emotions due to absorbing Rose's DNA. Being unable to kill Rose, or Van Staten having been convinced that it could just have freedom. Considering the all new emotions to be a sickness, the Dalek asked Rose to order it to self-destruct, preferring death to a life with emotions. She refused at first, but eventually gave the order, and it destroyed itself, presumably ending the time war for good that time. Despite this last Dalek killing itself because it didn't want to be part human, that wasn't the end of the Daleks completely. As the Doctor once again found out in the 2005 two-parter story, Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways. A lone ship containing the Emperor Dalek of the war also barely survived the Time War, falling through time in a heavily damaged state. It went into seclusion at the edge of the solar system, damaged but rebuilding. During the fourth great bout of a human empire in the year 199,909, it secretly installed the mighty Jagrafess of the Holy Hadrajasset Matsuromfo aboard Satellite 5 to play the long game of slowly manipulating humans and re-establishing the Dalek species and fleet. The Jagrafess employed the editor played by Simon Pegg to overlook things for him. But a hundred years after the Jagrafess and the editors were killed, in the year 200,100, the Emperor was still using Satellite 5, now renamed the Game Station, to manipulate humanity and conceal his fleet. The Emperor secretly used transmat technology aboard the space station to kidnap humans for nearly 200 years, forcing them to play in several game shows including Weakest Link, The Big Brother and What Not to Wear, with losers being transported to the Dalek ships and to use as experiments for rebuilding the Dalek army. Kidnapped humans were harvested for their genetic material and one cell in a billion was used to rebuild the new Dalek race numbering roughly half a million aboard a fleet of 200 ships. When the Ninth Doctor, Rose and Captain Jack Harkness were transmatted into the games, they quickly escaped and discovered from the controller that the Daleks were the masters. Once detected, the Daleks began their invasion plans and quickly killed all the humans that had either not evacuated yet or chosen to fight. And one of the most scary and badass scenes for the Daleks from this episode is when they go to Floor Zero to kill all the humans that chose not to join the fight. Because there was no need for the Daleks to kill those humans since they were unarmed and defenseless. But they did it anyway just because they were not Dalek. That's just so awesomely Dalek in my opinion. Captain Jack was one of the humans killed in the process with the Doctor sending Rose back to 2005 to protect her. To make the Earth into their paradise, the Daleks also heavily bombed the Earth with continents such as Australasia, being described as gone in the aftermath. Just as the Daleks were about to exterminate the Doctor, the TARDIS materialised and Rose, who had absorbed the energy of the Time Fortets, had become an entity known as Bad Wolf, stepped out. She scattered the words Bad Wolf across time and space to inspire Rose to become the entity in the first place. She then divided the atoms of the entire Dalek fleet, turning them all, including the Emperor who had claimed to be immortal, to dust. And then, in what would be called by the Tenth Doctor the final act of the Time War, she resurrected Jack from the dead, accidentally giving him immortality. To save her life, the Doctor absorbed the Time Vortex from Rose, which had caused him to regenerate into his next incarnation. With the Ninth Doctor being confident that the human race would rebuild itself, thus ending the Time War once and for all, once again. So with the Dalek Emperor and his entire fleet destroyed at the hands of Rose Tyler and the Time Fortet, 
It seemed like the Dalek Emperor was wiped out for good. But that was not to be, as the Doctor and Rose found out in the 2006 two-parter, Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. During the last Great Time War, there was a secret order of Daleks known as the Cult of Scaro, with the members Dalek Fey, Dalek Jast and Dalek Khan, and their leader Dalek Sek, being tasked by the Emperor to imagine new ways of survival, thinking as the enemy thinks and even daring to have names. During the war, they sold Time Lord technology known as the Genesis Ark, and built themselves a void ship and escaped from the Time War to survive and restore the Dalek supremacy if they ever faced near extinction. In present day Earth, the Tortured Institute's meddling began to open the barrier into the void which had been broken down by the cult's void ship. Tortured Tower, known to the public as Canary Wharf, led by Yvonne Hartman, had been built around the gap into the void so that Tortured One could study it and use its energy. But doing this caused the Cybermen from Pete's world to break through the barriers from their world and travel through to ours, bringing 5 million Cybermen into our world. And the Cult of Scar at last emerged with the Genesis Ark from the Void Ship. Now this cliffhanger for an Army of Ghosts was one hell of a great cliffhanger, and it had many Doctor Who fans shitting themselves when as soon as they saw it for the first time. But I'd say it's up there with the cliffhanger for part one of Earthshock. Spoilers guys, the Cybermen showed up in that one. They soon discovered that the Cybermen had already invaded Earth, and ended up starting an all-out war with them leading to the Battle of Canary Wharf, while humanity was caught in the middle of the conflict, but not before giving some great pre-battle banter. They are such bitches. <laughs> he then opened the Genesis Ark with the help of Mickey the Idiot's handprint since he travelled through time in the TARDIS as well, and released millions of Daleks onto England. It turned out then that the Genesis Ark was actually a Time Lord prison ship, which had millions of Daleks prisoned in it from the Time War. And as soon as they escaped the void, Daleks had ordered New Army to exterminate all life forms below them, humans and Cybermen. All these Daleks were sucked into the Void along with the Cybermen by the Tenth Doctor's interference. However, the Cult of Scaro escaped before being returned to the Void using an emergency temporal shift. With the Battle of Canary Wharf ended with many casualties, it seemed like the Daleks were gone for good for the Doctor. But we all knew the truth. This time around we knew that the Daleks weren't finished for good since Daleks Ek and the Cult of Scaro had escaped using an emergency temporal shift. But we wouldn't see them again until the 2007 story, Daleks in Manhattan and Evolution of the Daleks. After using the Emergency Temporal Shift, the cult ended up in New York in 1930. They infiltrated the construction of the Empire State Building and began what they called the Final Experiment, the creation of a new Dalek race. Inside the sewers below the Empire State Building, they set up a genetic laboratory and attempted to create new Dalek embryos. After the failure of this experiment, they tried thinking creatively, as the cult were designed to do. They devised a plan using humans' greatest resource, its people. They placed Dalek Anium onto the mass of the Empire State Building, intended to fuse the DNA of Daleks and humans using an oncoming ray of gamma radiation from the sun. Dalek Sect tested this on Mr. Diagoras, becoming a Dalek-human hybrid, now with human thoughts and emotions. As the invasion of Manhattan began, Dalek Set began to want the Dalek humans to keep their human emotions. Having Dalek Set discover that sticking to their purity was what caused their near extinction in the first place was very controversial at the time. But it's a very interesting concept looking back at it years later. But the other Daleks, although bred to obey Sek, believed that this was against the Dalek cause. They secretly changed the DNA to 100% Dalek and imprisoned Dalek Sek. Dalek Seg was of course pissed off with this betrayal, but the cult of Scaro answered back with this kick-ass line. You told us to imagine, and we imagined your irrelevance. I miss the cult's snarky attitude. 
Dalek Seg was later exterminated accidentally after the other cult members attempted to kill the Doctor. As the Doctor got in the way of the blast of the gamma radiation, it infused the DNA of some of his own. The human Daleks rebelled and killed Daleks Fay and Jast before being killed themselves by Dalek Khan. The Doctor offered to help Khan, the last surviving Dalek, but instead of taking it, Khan used an emergency temporal shift to escape once more. So most of the Cult of Skara were destroyed and the Daleks were wiped out once again, with Dalek Khan being the only one remaining. And he wouldn't pop up again until the 2008 two-part of Finale, The Stolen Earth and The Journey's End. We have to backtrack again to the Time War. In the first years of it to be at Zant, at the gates of Elysium, Davros along with his command ship was doomed to destruction in the war when it flew into the jaws of the Nightmare Child. But just before his demise, Dalek Khan was able to enter the Time War despite it being time-locked and save Davros from his death at the cost of his own sanity. But Davros saw this as a great achievement, having won Dalek succeed where Time Lords had failed. This gave Davros time to rebuild a new Dalek army and prepare the new invasions of Earth. In the stories The Stolen Earth and Journey's End, he created a new race of Daleks by giving himself to them, literally with each Dalek grown from one of his body cells. Eventually they stole 27 planets, including Earth, in an attempt to power their new machine, the Reality Bomb, from their Crucible command ship. This invasion was so bad that it brought a majority of the Doctor's companions together. Rose Tyler, Mickey Smith, Martha Jones, Donna Noble, Sarah Jane Smith and Captain Jack Harkness were able to summon the Doctor to the Medusa Cascade where all the planets were being kept. As the Doctor and each of his companions were captured by the Daleks, it was revealed that the Reality Bomb was being used to destroy all of humanity and reality, making the Daleks the only life forms in existence. They tested their new weapon on the prisoners that they had captured from Earth, and when the test was successful they planned to use full transmission to dissolve the entire universe, ours and every parallel world alike, leaving only the Daleks. When the Doctor and his former companions banded together to stop Davros and the Daleks from using their reality bomb, all of their efforts failed until Davros electrocuted Donna Noble, who had previously touched the Doctor's spare hand which he had put his regeneration energy into shortly after a Dalek had exterminated him in the streets. And by touching the hand, Donna created a Metacrisis Doctor who was half Time Lord, half human, and that electrocution from Davros woke up a bit of Time Lord consciousness within Donna, allowing her to take control of the Crucible and bring in the Daleks down to their knees. If they had knees, that is. It was revealed then that Dalek Khan had actually seen what the Daleks had done throughout time and space, and had planned to bring about the end of the species, which resulted in the Metacrisis Doctor destroying the entire Dalek fleet along with the Crucible. The Tenth Doctor, appalled by this action, offered to help Davros escape from his demise, but Davos declined, blaming the Doctor for what had happened and naming him the Destroyer of Worlds before disappearing in a fiery flame. So with Davos, Dalek Khan and the entire Dalek fleet as well as the Crucible destroyed, that seemed like the end of the Dalek race once and for all. But that didn't last very long as we found out in the 2010 episode, Victory of the Daleks. In the Series 5 episode, Victory of the Daleks, it was revealed that three of the Daleks survived on one ship which fell back through time to 1940s Earth, where they ended up finding a Dalek progenitor device during World War II, hatching a plan to get the Doctor to use his testimony to open it since the progenitor saw their DNA as impure and create a new breed of Daleks. I didn't talk about Victory of the Daleks in as much detail as I did the previous episodes, because I think Stolen Earth and Journey's End was a better ending for the Time War Daleks storyline since they went out like badasses, whereas the ones in Vidri of the Daleks just accepted their fate, went out like assholes. But it's still a fun story to look back on years later. And these new Dalek designs had the potential to show what they could really do as Steven Moffat originally intended before he gave in to the fans complaining about their design and how they looked too plasticky. Of course he did try to fix it by making them look more metallic in the sign of the Daleks, but after that episode he eventually gave up on them, giving in to the fans and angry letters and whatnot. And the Time War Daleks bronze designs took around for a long time in the show, going through the Stephen Moffat era right into the Chris Chibnall era, and we have no idea if Russell T Davis is going to stick with this in the case and or if he's going to create a new Dalek design in the future, but we'll have to wait and see. 
but it's pretty needless to say that the Dalek design from 2005 has become really popular and iconic over the years. While well, over the years we have been getting the same breed of from Time War Daleks with that bronze design over the years, Russell T. Davis and even Chris Chibnall had given us a few newer ones then, with some different colour schemes and different weaponries. The first new weaponry Dalek we had was the ones from the Parting of the Ways, where they had that drill that could cut through doors. The Parting of the Ways even gave us those Imperial Guard Daleks we saw next to the Emperor Dalek, with the Black Domes and the different weaponries. The second one was with Dalek Sec with that jet black casing, which I think should come back as different Daleks rather than just Dalek Sec brought back from the dead. I think that jet black Dalek casing would make great for a Dalek leader in the fleets, either as another Supreme Dalek or perhaps the Dalek commander who commands the fleet. The Stolen Earth and Journey's End gave us two new Dalek variants for the Time War Daleks. That busy Supreme Dalek with the red and gold paintings and the additions to make it look taller as well as three lights on its dome. And those cool Crucible Daleks with those weapons where we have no idea what the hell they do. And they never even revealed what they did, but they look cool all the same. Even Stephen Moffat gave us a different variant in Victory of the Daleks with the Ironside Daleks. Set up to look like they came from World War II. To me, they look really awesome, and it feels like they could have come from the Genesis of the Dalek story if it was made back in 2010, with those packs around their casings containing whatever the hell they're supposed to contain, and that Union Jack on their dome instead of the Dalek symbols that they usually have. That looks really awesome in my opinion. And while Chris Chibnall brought back the bronze Dalek designs for Revolution of the Daleks and Eve of the Daleks, he changed them up a little bit by giving them some new weapons. In Revolution, they had these claw-like weapons that never really did anything, to be honest, and seemed like they were just there just because the defense drones had it. Then in Eve of the Daleks, they gave the Execution Squad Daleks an awesome new ray gun that shot multiple rays of death. Sort of like a machine gun, which I think is really awesome, by the way. But either way you look at it, it's still the same original Bonds design when they could have at least given them a new color scheme or given each of them different colored domes or something. Like what they did with the CGI Imperial Guard Daleks from the part of the ways. Just give us a little bit of variety. And with Russell T. Davis returning as head writer, we have no idea if he's going to create a new Dalek design or stick with the Time War Dalek designs that he created. And if he does create a new design, then I really am going to miss the Time War Dalek designs because that's the design I grew up with. But if he doesn't make a new design and sticks with this one, I expect to see some variety in their cases like different colour schemes, different weapons, new ranks, and so on and so forth. But whatever he decides to do, it's needless to say that he's going to create some badass Dalek stories again, just like he did in the old days. The Daleks have gone through many design changes over the years since 1965, with their silver and blues, their greys, their whites and golds, and so on and so forth. But the Time War Dalek designs is one of the most iconic designs in the series, as since it's the one that stuck around the longest. And some people are either really sick of this design or they really love this design and want to see it go on for many years to come. And I'm one of those that's sort of somewhere in the middle. On one hand I love the design because it's the one I grew up with. But on the other hand I'd like to either see a new design be introduced in some time in the near future or at least give us some varieties at the Time War design. But whatever happens we all know that Russell T Davis is going to give us some badass and awesome Dalek stories once again. And until then, we got their reappearance to look forward to in the special in October. And whatever happens in the future of the Russell T. Davis 0.2, we all know we're going to get some awesome Dalek stories once again. And I look forward to seeing what they're going to be up to in the future of the series. I'm Dalek44, and I'll see you next time, folks.
Hey guys, Dali44 here. I need no introduction, but I got one anyway. Well, Christmas has come once again. We can all enjoy our presents now that it's Boxing Day. And as we're in Christmas 2022, I thought that now would be a good time to talk about the Raymond Briggs classic, The Snowman. The Snowman is a 1982 British animated television film based on Raymond Briggs's 1978 picture book The Snowman. It was directed by Diane Jackson for Channel 4 and first aired on the 26th of December 1982. It was nominated for Best Animated Short Film at the 55th Academy Awards and won a BAFTA TV award. And it got so popular that they even made an animated sequel for 2012, The Snowman and the Snow Dog. And since today marks the 40th anniversary of when this special first aired back in the days, I thought it would be really fitting to go through it this year, being a Christmas special that I hadn't seen since I was a child. It was definitely a breath of fresh air revisiting this again after so long. Just watching an old hand-drawn animated film from the 1980s. You've heard me talk about his Father Christmas adventure a few years ago, so what do I think of his original Christmas tale based on a snowman? Let's have a look. After a night of heavy snowfall, James, a young boy, wakes up and plays in the snow, eventually building a large snowman. At the stroke of midnight, he sneaks downstairs to find the snowman magically comes to life. James shows the snowman around his house, playing with appliances, toys, and other bric-a-brac, all while keeping quiet enough not to wake James's parents. The two find a sheeted down motorbike in the house's garden and go for a ride on it through the woods. Its engine heat starts to melt the snowman and he cools off, luxuriating in a garage freezer. Seeing a picture of the Arctic on a packet in the freezer, the snowman is agitated and takes the boy in hand, running through the garden until they take flight. Seeing the Royal Pavilion and Brighton Palace Pier, and north along the coast of Norway. They continue through an Arctic landscape and into the Aurora Borealis. Aurora Borealis! At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, yes. They land in a snow-covered forest where they join a party of snowmen. They eventually meet Father Christmas along with his reindeer. He gives the boy a card and a scarf of a snowman pattern. The snowman returns home with James before the sun rises and the two bid farewell for the night. The following morning, James wakes up to find the snowman has melted, leaving only his hat, scarf, coal eyes, tangerine nose and coal buttons in a pile of melted snow. After discovering the snowman's scarf in his pocket from the night prior, confirming that the events were real and not a dream, James kneels down by the snowman's remains while holding his scarf, mourning for the loss of his friend. The snowman is honestly one of the most whimsical Christmas tales I have ever seen in years. This is one of the most stunning animated films I've ever seen in my lifetime, mainly due to the fact that it's hand-drawn, and the way it's hand-drawn just makes it look like it came from the book directly. And you can see all the pencil lines in the drawings as well. Especially when the characters move around and interact with stuff, you can definitely see all the pencil lines that go into the animation. And it's a breath of fresh air if you watch this special, especially since we're now living in a world where animation is dominated by computers. So it's a real breath of fresh air for everyone in this generation to see an animated film that's completely hand-drawn. Compare this film to Father Christmas, which came out a few years later. This film has no dialogue in it. It's a silent picture. It's one of those Christmas specials that doesn't really need any dialogue to be enjoyed. Just the emotions of the characters and the beautiful hand drawings are enough to show you the story. You can see how the characters are feeling with every frame of this film. And the story is so simple that you don't really matter that it doesn't have any dialogue. It's a film that could be enjoyed in any country. Much like Pingu, where you don't know what the characters are saying, but you don't need to to be able to enjoy it. It's also unlike most Christmas specials you see nowadays where there has to be a villain who hates Christmas and the hero shows them the true meaning of Christmas or stops their plans in some way or another. It's just a simple whimsical tale about a snowman that comes to life and hangs out with a little boy. And the simple things are really all you need a lot of the times at Christmas. And the music is just so whimsical and Christmassy that it makes me feel all Christmassy inside. And it's also become really famous for the song Walking in the Air which you hear on the radio all the time around Christmas. And you can't blame them for playing it every Christmas, it's just such a whimsical song. It was sung by Peter Orty, who was not credited in the original version, and yet he was given credit on the 20th anniversary version. And since then, the song has been covered by other people. Then in 1985, the song was covered by Alan Jones in a single which peaked at number 5 on the UK singles chart. 
The sun's just left a huge impact on everyone that everyone always associated around Christmas time. And my favourite part of this whole film, aside from the walking in the air musical number, is the snowman party in the North Pole. Just seeing all these different snowmen is just stunning to me. It just looks like a big Christmas party that you never want to end. And we get lots of different snowmen wearing different outfits. You see snowmen wearing Christmas cracker hats, and winter hats, you even see one wearing a kilt. When was the last time you ever saw a snowman wear a kilt? That's just an awesome image. They even had Father Christmas return to the party in the film Father Christmas, just to make a nice nod to that previous film. Another thing I find really unique about this film is the fact that it starts off being really whimsical and happy, but then has that ultra sad ending when you see that the snowman has melted the next morning. Quite funny how the whole film goes off with being whimsical and cheerful, and then it just ends on a sad note. That's not very often that happens in Christmas specials. Well, most of the ones I've seen anyway, there have been some sad endings in Doctor Who Christmas specials as well. But just having the snowman melt and die like that at the end is a really sad way to end a Christmas special, don't you think? But it does get more people talking about it and remembering it over the years, so you can't really fault it for that, can you? This is one of those endings that doesn't talk down to the kids, and I really like that. It's one of those endings that doesn't sugarcoat anything and just gives you the straight up details. Not dumbing down to the children just because it's a family film. And I really love the friendship that was made between the boy and the snowman throughout the film. Even though the snowman was going to melt in the end of the story, you can really tell how much they bonded throughout the story. Just seeing all the fun activities they do from exploring things around the house, riding a motorbike, flying over England and travelling to the North Pole for a snowman party to meet Father Christmas. You can tell how much they're really bonding throughout this story, which makes the ending all the more sad. This is another one of those Christmas specials I hadn't seen since I was a child, but I've heard the song walking in the air multiple times this time of year. So it was really nice and refreshing to revisit it again after all these years. And when you rewatch the moment where they're flying over the world just to get to the North Pole for the snowman party, it honestly looks like something that could have come out of a 3D movie. If they'd remake this movie for the 3D format, then I would definitely go see it on the big screen, just to get that 3D experience when they're flying over the world. It's just one of those awesome iconic moments that associates with this film as well as Christmas in general. I even got to ride a simulator ride for it at Bristol in the Explore area, and it got so popular that eventually in 2012 they made the sequel to the story, The Snowman and the Snow Dog, which I still have yet to see, but I'm sure it'll be as good as the original. Please don't give me any spoilers, I really want to find out for myself. They even made Iron Brew adverts based on the short film, and if you've seen it then you'll know that it's funny as hell. Many people love this film, and having rewatched it again after all these years, I can see why. It's a lovely whimsical hand-drawn Christmas special that you can watch around Christmas time and just get in the Christmas spirit. And as I said, it's a nice change of pace for today's generation to see a completely hand-drawn special compared to the computer animated ones we see nowadays. In my mind, The Snowman is definitely one of the best Christmas specials you'll ever see on television. It's one of those few specials that's centred around Christmas that is traditionally hand-drawn. In a world that's dominated by computer animation, this is one of the best hand-drawn specials that you'll ever see. If you haven't watched The Snowman in years, or just haven't seen it at all, then I would definitely recommend checking it out at Christmas. It's a lovely whimsical story with no dialogue, a simple story, and it just feels so Christmassy that you'll want to watch it again and again and again. It's definitely worth your time. Well, I hope you've all had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, everyone, and look out for more reviews next year. I'm Dolly44, and I'll see you in 2023, folks. Merry Christmas. Take it away, montage.